The Anti-Imperialism of Deep Space Nine. 2. The Great Powers. The imperial rivalry for power, national pride, and resources motivate the alien empires of DS9, such as the Cardassians, Klingons, Romulans, Ferengi, and the Dominion, in their relations with each other and the Federation, which will be considered separately. For instance, one of the primary antagonists during the early seasons of DS9 are the Cardassians, a society which could easily be described as totalitarian, with service to the state as the highest goal, the Maquis Part 2. An ever-vigilant and ruthless secret police force known as the Obsidian Order, the Wire. A jury system where the accused is always guilty, tribunal. The complex politics of the Cardassian Empire is an ever-present theme within the show. At the beginning of the series, the long-lasting Cardassian occupation of Bajor ended following shifts within the government. However, elements of the Cardassian military, notably the charismatic and brutal Gold Dukat, opposed the withdrawal from Bajor, emissary, to the point of planning a military coup, and always dreamed of returning to control of the planet. Cardassian and call to arms. The resultant legacy of the Cardassian occupation of Bajor, discussed at greater length below, on both Cardassia and the Bajorans, is a recurrent series motif. Picture. Klingons attack DS9. Until Season 5, the Cardassians are involved in a cold peace with the Federation, seeking to negotiate new borders. The Maquis, Parts 1 and 2 and deal with a growing internal dissident movement, profit and loss, and second skin. Ultimately, the destruction of the Cardassian Obsidian Order while fighting the Dominion allows for a civilian uprising to occur and overthrow the rule of the Central Command and install a democratic government, die is cast and way of the warrior. However, the new Cardassian government is not given a moment's respite but it is believed by the Klingon Empire that the change in government was orchestrated by shapeshifters from another rival power, the Dominion. The Klingons mass a major invasion force and take over Cardassia. While the Federation sees this as a blatant act of aggression, the Klingons do not justify their actions of simply a desire for power. Rather, they argue that the invasion is meant to protect the Alpha Quadrant of the galaxy from Dominion invasion. Klingon General Martok says, quote, Are you saying the Federation will sit back and do nothing while Klingon soldiers give their lives to protect the Alpha Quadrant? Way of the Warrior. The Federation abrogates its treaty with the Klingons by warning the Cardassians about the invasion and rescuing the leaders of the Cardassian government. Sisko and his crew discover that they aren't shapeshifters but Martok insists that it doesn't matter. This leads to a bloody battle at Deep Space Nine between the well-armed Federation station and the Klingon fleet. However, before all-out war escalates, Sisko manages to convince the Klingons to stand down, because it will only leave them all open to Dominion attack. The exchange between Sisko, Worf, Martok, and the Klingon Chancellor is revealing about how much inter-imperialist rivalry shapes the motive of the varying powers. Worf. The Empire is not strong enough to fight the Federation and the Cardassians. End this now, Gowron, before you lead the Empire to its worst defeat in history. Martok. We will not surrender. Sisko. This is exactly what the Founders want. Klingon against Cardassian, Federation against Klingon. The more we fight each other, the weaker we'll get, and the less chance we have against the Dominion. Worf. Consider what you do here, Gowron. Kalis himself said, destroying an empire to win a war is no victory. Gowron, and ending a battle to save an empire is no defeat. Martok, we can still win. Sisko, not before those starships get here. Now what do I tell them, to stand down or to come in firing? Gowron, it is we who shall stand down. Gowron, enough, cease fire. Order our ships in Cardassian territory to halt their advance. I do not intend to hand victory to the Dominion. From Way of the Warrior. 
even though the Klingons stopped from going to an outright war with the Federation, they fortified several key Cardassian planets. Throughout Season 4, there was a tense standoff between the Federation and the Klingons, as the latter sought to blockade the Bajoran Sector, Sons of Moog, blame a civilian massacre on Starfleet officers, rules of engagement, and continues to launch deadly raids in Cardassian space, Return to Grace. Ultimately, ancient Klingon claims to the planet Arcanus lead to a short-lived war with the Federation. It is revealed at the end of Season 4 that Galron, the leader of the Klingon Empire, is a shapeshifter, who is presumably manipulating the Klingon Empire into war to weaken both powers. Broken Link. This leads Starfleet to send a covert team to expose the Changeling, and hopefully end the war. Yet, as it turned out, the real infiltrator was actually Martok, and if the Federation killed Galron, prevented by Odo, this would have led to the Martok changeling taking power and continuing the war until both powers were completely destroyed. Although the Klingons seemingly prize honor and victory and war above everything, the ever-present Dominion threat causes negotiations to be opened with the Federation. Galron True, but if your Klingon blood wasn't so thin, you'd know that once battle has begun, there can be no turning back. You want the war to end, then the Federation must allow us to annex Arcanus and the other worlds we've seized. Sisko, I wouldn't count on it, but if the fighting stops and the negotiations begin... Galron, ah yes, talk. Odo, that's right, talk, the last thing the Dominion wants. From Apocalypse Rising. Although there remains a few more skirmishes with the Federation, nor the battle to the strong, once the Dominion moves into the Alpha Quadrant, the Federation and the Klingons renew their military alliance and remain united throughout the Long War, by Inferno's Light. This statement of Martok reveals the seemingly high-minded ideals of the Klingon Empire, placing honor and the greater good above all. Despite their rhetoric, the Klingons are an incredibly corrupt society where crimes are covered up, lives are wasted in personal feuds, tacking into the wind, and great houses destroy each other using dishonorable methods over ancient feuds, House of Quark. Indeed, a person's bloodline is deemed more worthwhile than their willingness to serve the Empire. This is precisely how Kor justifies denying granting Martok a chance to be an officer. Worf. He says that you struck his name from an officer's list because his family comes from the Cathololans. Kor. Did I? I don't recall. Of course, there were so many officer lists. I suppose it's possible. Worf. It is an unworthy reason to bar a man from serving the Empire. Kor. Worf, you've been living among this democratic rabble for too long. I know your bloodline. We both come from noble houses. Among our people, that still counts for something. If Martok is a true Klingon, he should appreciate that. From Once More Into the Breach During the Dominion War, Galron is jeopardizing the whole front line by launching foolhardy offensives in order to discredit the popular Martok. When discussing the situation with Worf and how to deal with it, Esri Dax aptly summarizes the inner rot inside the Klingon Empire. Esri I think the situation with Galron is a symptom of a bigger problem. The Klingon Empire is dying, and I think it deserves to die. I see a society that is in deep denial about itself. We're talking about a warrior culture that prides itself on maintaining centuries-old traditions of honor and integrity but in reality it's willing to accept corruption at the highest levels. Worf. You are overstating your case. Ezri. Am I? Who was the last leader of the High Council that you respected? Has there even been one? And how many times have you had to cover up the crimes of Klingon leaders because you were told it was for the good of the Empire? I know this sounds harsh, but the truth is, you have been willing to accept a government that you know is corrupt. Galron's just the latest example. Worf, you are the most honorable and decent man I've ever met, 
and if you're willing to tolerate men like Gowron, then what hope is there for the Empire? From Tacking into the Wind Ultimately, Worf ends up challenging Gowron to honorable combat and kills him. By right and tradition, he should ascend to the leadership of the Empire, but gives the position to Martok. While Worf places great hopes on Martok's leadership, it remains an open question if one man can fundamentally change a corrupt empire, which has been militarily devastated in a long war. From Inter Arma Enim Silent Lege Picture of the Romulans One long-term enemy of the Klingons and the Federation is the Romulan Star Empire, another great power in the Alpha Quadrant. While the Klingons are noted for their use of brute force and the Federation for diplomacy to advance their interests, the Romulans primarily use subterfuge, manipulation, and seek to provoke their opponents to act before responding. Although, as we shall see, the Federation are willing to use similar methods in dealing with the Romulans. The Romulans are willing to work with other powers, including the Federation, to advance their interests. When the Dominion threat first appears, the Romulans loan them a cloaking device to use on the USS Defiant in exchange for all Federation intelligence on the new threat. From The Search and the Visionary Yet, the Romulans are also quite ruthless when the situation calls for it. When debriefing Starfleet on their intelligence in regards to the Dominion, the Romulan delegation also plans to destroy the station and the wormhole to eliminate that threat. Along with their delegation to Deep Space Nine, the Romulans send a cloaked ship to destroy the station. Sisko, I know that you have a cloaked warbird orbiting the station, and I know you're planning an attack. At first, I couldn't understand why, and then I remembered what you said about the Dominion, how they were the greatest threat to the Alpha Quadrant in the last century. If you really believed that, then the only way you could ever be truly safe from the Dominion would be to collapse the wormhole. Kira. But you knew we wouldn't just sit by and watch while you did it, so you had to destroy the station too. That way, there'd be no witnesses. Odo. Everyone would assume that Deep Space Nine was destroyed by what appeared to be the accidental collapse of the wormhole. From the Visionary. While the Romulan effort is thwarted, they remain determined to deal a crippling blow to the Dominion. And it is here that a fraction of the Romulan ruling class, notably around their intelligence service, the Tal Shiar, allies with the Cardassian secret police, the Obsidian Order, in a joint operation to destroy the founders of the Dominion. Episodes The Defiant, Improbable Cause, The Die is Cast. Ultimately, the attack is foiled by a Dominion infiltrator, and the fleets are wiped out, although the survivors are taken prisoner. The destruction of the two fleets does not seem to affect the internal structure of the Romulan Empire, but it opens the way to the collapse of the once powerful Cardassian Central Command. The temporary alliance of the class fractions within the Romulan and Cardassian Empires throws an added layer of complexity to DS9's inter-imperialist rivalry. Not only do the Imperial powers work to advance their own interests, but different rival factions are willing to join forces against perceived common enemies. And in the case of the Cardassians, when a significant chunk of the ruling class breaks away, this can cause a crisis of legitimacy and open the way to rebellion and revolution. Episodes Changing Face of Evil and The Dogs of War Thus, the need to maintain unity of the ruling class in the face of upheaval from below remains constant. Returning to the Romulans, as the struggle with the Dominion heats up, they seem to be willing to ally with the Federation and the Klingons. Episode By Inferno's Light. But quickly withdraw behind their borders and sign a non-aggression pact. Episode Call to Arms. The Romulans bide their time as their rivals fight each other in a long, bloody war. And even when it is clear that the Dominion is winning, the Romulans keep the bulk of their fleet poised for a conflict with the Federation. Considering the desperate nature of the war, the Federation needs allies, 
so Sisko and Garrick produce fake Dominion invasion plans of Romulus. Sisko attempts to convince a pro-Dominion Romulan senator to join forces with them against the Dominion. At the same time, Senator Vrenak shows the Romulan desire to stay out of the fighting by not backing a losing side. Vrenak You are persistent, Captain. I'll grant you that. But dogged determination isn't enough to change the reality of your situation. Time is definitely not on your side. The Dominion shipyards are working at 100% capacity. Yours are still being rebuilt. The Dominion is breeding legions of Jem'Hadar soldiers every day. You are experiencing a manpower shortage. But most important, the Dominion is resolved to win the war at any cost. You and I both know the Federation has already put out peace feelers. Now, in all candor, if you were in my position, which side would you choose? Sisko. I'd pick the side most likely to leave us in peace when the dust settles. Maybe you're right. Maybe the Dominion will win in the end. Then the Founders will control what we now call Cardassia, the Klingon Empire, and the Federation. So instead of facing three separate opponents with three separate agendas, you'll find yourselves facing the same opponent on every side. There's a word for that. Surrounded. Episode In the Pale Moonlight Sisko attempts to convince Vrenak with the fake Dominion invasion plans. When the Senator examines the plans, he discovers that they are fake, and threatens to expose the Federation's duplicity. However, as it turns out, Garrick understood that the plans would not pass muster, and assassinates the Senator, and frames the Dominion as the culprit. The Federation manipulation works, and the Romulans end up at war with the Dominion, which turns the tide enough for the Allied powers to soon launch a counteroffensive. Episode, The Tears of the Prophets Despite the new alliance, inter-imperialist tensions remain high between the Federation and the Romulans. The Romulans attempt at one point to gain a strategic position in the Bajoran sector, threatening the joint alliance, episodes Images in the Sand and Shadows and Symbols, before backing down. At the same time, the Federation realizes that once the dust settles, that the Romulans will be their main rival. And the Federation, through Section 31, is quite willing to manipulate the inner workings of the highest levels of the Romulan government to ensure that someone is installed who will serve their interests. And it doesn't matter that the person in the crossfire and ousted from power, Senator Kretak, was a Romulan patriot who believed in the Federation alliance. Yet, as Federation Admiral Ross recognizes, a Romulan patriot, even one who believes in the Alliance, is not to be trusted, since, if it is in the best interest of the Empire to make a peace, she would pursue that option. Ross No, she wasn't. I told you before, Julian, she's a patriot. Which means, if it served the interests of the Romulans to negotiate a separate peace with the Dominion, Kretak would push that option. And believe me, the Dominion would like nothing better than to make a deal with the Romulans right now. Episode Inter Arma Enem Silent Lege Following the Romulans, we bring ourselves to the next major imperial power, the Ferengi Alliance. Unlike all the alien powers considered thus far, the Ferengi were not devoted to territorial conquest, but on trade and commerce. Ferengi government and civilization is built on the ethos of capitalism and profit. Although the Ferengi would despise everything Karl Marx stood for, they would no doubt agree with his characterization of capitalism as a society built on the pursuit of profit. Quote, Accumulate, accumulate, that is Moses and the prophets. Quote, Industry furnishes the material which saving accumulates. Therefore, save, save, i.e. reconvert the greatest possible portion of surplus value, or surplus product, into capital. End quote. In Ferenghi society, the commerce is governed according to the rules of acquisition, which are described by Quark as follows. Quote, Every Ferengi business transaction is governed by 285 rules of acquisition, 
to ensure a fair and honest deal for all parties concerned. Well, most of them anyway. End quote. Episode The Maquis, Part 1. And even though the Ferengi government possesses a laissez faire attitude in regards to many aspects of the economy, notably in regards to worker safety, social benefits, and taxation, episode Dogs of War, like any capitalist state, it does ensure that business and trade are done according to agreed upon rules, the rules of acquisition. If a Ferengi broke a contract, they were subjected to severe penalties, such as the loss of their ability to make profit. Episode Body Parts However, the government is built upon corruption, graft, and bribery. Brunt Hard work, bribes, sucking up to the boss, just like any other job. Episode Family Business However, the Ferengi, unlike every great power in DS9, are generally not interested in warfare. Although individual Ferengi are engaged in arms dealing, episode business as usual, rather they stayed neutral. Making enemies would only lessen business opportunities for the Ferengi. This made the Ferengi available as intermediaries between hostile species, episode Starship Down. For the Ferengi, war is generally seen as too costly. In an exchange with his nephew Nog, Quark explains the Ferengi approach to acquiring peace. Quark I'll tell you one thing, nephew. If the Federation had listened to the Ferengi Alliance, there never would have been a war. Nog Because we would have surrendered a long time ago. Quark No. We would have reached an accommodation. We would have sat across the negotiation table and hammered out a peace treaty. One that both sides could live with. Nog, you make it sound so simple. Quark, rule of acquisition 125. You can't make a deal if you're dead. Episode, Siege of AR-558. As a result of this pragmatic business approach to war and peace, the Ferengi have avoided becoming involved in major interstellar wars. Nor was Ferengi history marked by slavery with an important exception, as we shall see, and genocide, which made Ferengi such as Quark believe that they were superior to humans. Episode Jem'Hadar Yet Ferengi society is marked by deeply patriarchal and sexist attitudes, with deeply rooted discrimination. Women were not allowed to own property, engage in business, or travel. Women were also not allowed to wear clothing, leave their homes, or even speak, and were expected to produce male heirs. Episode Family Business Marriage in Ferengi society is considered little more than a business contract, like any other, and pregnancy is considered a rental. Episode Dr. Bashir, I presume, and Nor the Battle to the Strong. However, some women such as Quark's mother Ishka did engage in secret business transactions, and due to her relationship with the leader of the Ferengi, Grand Negus Zek. She pushed for various reform measures, such as allowing women to wear clothing, in the hopes that this would lead to an even greater status for women in Ferengi society. Episodes Business as Usual, Ferengi Love Songs, and Profit and Lace. However, Ishka's ambition was not for an overturning of Ferengi society and the installation of a new social system, but equality within it. Episode Profit and Lace. Even though capitalism remained the dominant ideology and practice of the Ferengi, this did not prevent class conflict from erupting. Even though, as Rahm said, quote, Ferengi workers don't want to stop the exploitation, we want to find a way to become the exploiters. Episode Bar Association However, Ferengi workers were ruthlessly exploited, denied decent wages, health benefits, and employers could demand sexual favors from those underneath them. As Rule of Acquisition 211 stated, quote, Employees are the rungs on the ladder of success. Don't hesitate to step on them. Episode Bar Association The idea of a labor, quote, union was considered a forbidden word by the Ferengi, and forming one was subjected to severe sanctions by the government, such as having their accounts frozen. 
Yet there were instances when exploitation was so crushing that workers were willing to risk everything to unionize and resist their employers. Episode Bar Association As DS9 ends, Ferengi society was undergoing major reforms for the first time in generations, instituting progressive income taxation, retirement benefits, social programs, wage subsidies for the poor, and health care. For Ferengi traditionalists such as Quark, these reforms were seen as going against the very nature of capitalism. Quote, Whatever happened to survival of the fittest? Whatever happened to the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer? Whatever happened to pure, unadulterated greed? End quote. Episode, The Dogs of War. Yet the ascension to power of Rom as Grand Nagus, a progressive Ferengi who treats his wife as an equal, union organizer, and sympathetic to Federation values, promises that the reforms will continue, and Ferengi society, while remaining capitalist, will have a substantial social welfare state. Picture. A Jem'Hadar soldier. The final great power to be considered here is the Dominion. The Dominion rules a vast interstellar empire in the Gamma Quadrant, backed up by a massive military force, and were technologically superior to most Alpha Quadrant empires. The Dominion was run by a species of shapeshifters, or changelings, known as the Founders. The Founders were seen as gods or myths by subject races, and their word was considered law. The Founders were once peaceful explorers, but were persecuted by, quote, solids, due to their ability to change form. Yet the Founders saw themselves as superior to other species, since their ability to change form gave them multiple perspectives as opposed to just one. Solids were seen as small, insignificant, needing guidance from the Founders, even if this meant breaking their desire for freedom. Episode Favor of the Bold As a result, the Founders established an empire and decided to impose their own form of order. The great powers of the Alpha Quadrant were seen as chaotic threats to the Founders. Episode Search Part 2 Since the Founders were long-lived, they planned for the long haul, often making minor concessions in the short term in order to secure an advantage for the longer term. Episode Statistical Probabilities While the Founders had the final say in the Dominion, day-to-day -day affairs were managed by a species known as the Vorta, who serve as administrators, troop commanders, scientists, and diplomats. The Vorta were genetically engineered to serve the Founders and worship them. Episodes to the Death, Ties of Blood and Water, and treachery, faith, and the great river. The foot soldiers of the Dominion are the Jem'Hadar, who are also genetically engineered to kill. Like the Vorta, the Jem'Hadar are also programmed to worship the Founders. But this loyalty, like that of the Vorta, was not absolute. So to further ensure the loyalty of the Jem'Hadar, they were addicted to a drug known as Ketracel White, if the Jem'Hadar did not receive the drug on a regular basis, they would die. Episodes The Abandoned, Hippocratic Oath, To the Death, Rocks and Trolls. Even if the Jem'Hadar were betrayed by their superiors, which happened on occasion, they were still ready to die to defend, quote, the order of things. Ramataklan He does not have to earn my loyalty, Captain. He has had it from the moment I was conceived. I am a Jem'Hadar, he is a Vorta, it is the order of things. Sisko, do you really want to give up your life for the order of things? Ramataklan, it is not my life to give up, Captain, and it never was. From the episode Rocks and Shoals. As mentioned above, the Dominion was founded upon the desire for control and to impose its kind of order on any real or perceived threats. Yet the Dominion method to achieve this control varied considerably. At times, the Dominion was willing to appear benevolent, offering assistance and rebuilding infrastructure. Episodes Call to Arms and Rocks and Shoals. 
they welcomed new species into the Dominion, such as the Cardassians, provided they obeyed the Founders. Episode by Inferno's Light. However, should any species get out of line or rebel, they could expect punishment, such as military intervention by Jamhadar, being inflicted by a deadly plague, or even being exterminated. Episodes The Quickening and What They Left Behind. In order to prevent rebellion, the Dominion was even willing to wipe out the population of whole planets, such as Earth. Episode Sacrifice of Angels. While the Dominion was quite willing to engage in warfare, during initial contacts with alien species, they used espionage, so discord, and used divide-and-conquer tactics. For instance, the ability of the Founders to change form made them perfect spies, who were able to infiltrate high levels of government, replace key figures such as Martok, and instigate trouble. For instance, the mere threat of Dominion spies on Earth caused a near panic and practically led to a military coup by Starfleet, even though only four changelings were on the planet. Episodes Homefront and Paradise Lost When the Obsidian Order and the Tal Shiar planned to wipe out the Founders, the Dominion sent in a spy to ensure that the two forces joined together so that they could be wiped out, since both were considered ruthlessly efficient organizations. Episode Die is Cast the Dominion use of the Martok Infiltrator ensured that the Federation and the Klingons fought each other, rather than the Dominion. What all of the Imperial powers in DS9 have in common is that all of them, even those who are allied with the Federation, are not romanticized. All of them are very much Imperialist powers, and whatever their rhetoric and differing governmental systems, are searching for spheres of influence, power, resources, and are willing to enter into alliances with other powers. Yet none of the powers is at all interested in the liberation of subject peoples, but to ensure the interests of their rulers by imposing their own order. And this is very much the case with any system of inter-imperialist rivalry. Take the example of the capitalist world in 1914, which possessed powers such as the constitutional monarchy of Britain, Republican France, the autocracies of Germany and Russia, and democratic USA. All of these were seemingly different methods of bourgeois rule. Don't change the essence that these were capitalist societies built upon the pursuit of profit, the exploitation of worker, and the establishment of vast and brutal colonial empires. Even the development of fascism and Nazism following World War I, which engineered the genocide of the Jews and the Holocaust in Europe, was refining previous practices of the colonial powers in Africa and Asia. As W.E.B. Du Bois said, quote, There was no Nazi atrocity, concentration camps, whole-scale maiming and murder, defilement of women, or ghastly blasphemy of childhood, which the Christian civilization of Europe had not long been practicing against colored folk in all parts of the world in the name of and for the defense of a superior race born to rule the world, end quote. Or to use an old Maoist phrase when discussing whether the imperialist Churchill was better than the Nazi Hitler, it depends on where you say it, quote, If you think that Hitler is worse than Churchill, you had better say that in Belgium and not in India, end quote. What DS9 gives us is a picture of inter-imperialist rivalry, where there are no clear-cut good guys, but different great powers pursuing their own interests. And when the series ends with Federation victory in the Dominion War, it appears that it is simply the establishment of a new imperialist alliance in preparation for another war. However, the reader may legitimately ask, where does the liberation of the masses and revolution fit in? What about the role of the Federation? It is to the latter subject which we now turn. End section.